Welcome back, delegates. Our fourth talk will be given by Dr. Dilip Valke on end of life decisions in critical care. Dr. Dilip Valke is an MBBS and an MS of obstetrics and gynecology, consultant in Jupiter Hospital Banner and Vital Life Mary Point Hospital in Aund, Pune, Chairman Ethics and Medical Legal Committee of the Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecological Societies of India, 2007-2010, President of the Pune Obstetrics and Gynecology Society, 2019-20, and Mentor and Founder of Pune IVF. He is also on the Advisory Board Member of Dr. Prax Telemedicine Solutions. We welcome you, sir. one year
अभी होगा ना शोर ओके अभी वो स्लाइड आगे नहीं जा रही ओके नाउ सिंस ऑल दिस लीगल लिम्यूनरीज दैट आई कॉल देम the fact that i know them and the fact that i am friends with some of them make me look like a medical legal expert actually i am not i am just a simple clinician and only because i interact with these legal luminaries i am seen as a medical legal expert so what the secret of my talk is what i do is i discuss with them i nag them till i record all the legal jargon that these people use and i use it in my talk in a very simple language and to which i add my legal tarka of abandon clinical caution but i had a little more cut off of some of the jugards that we can do in our clinical practice and that's how my talk becomes that is the secret of my talk whenever i speak on medical legal aspects and you know what i whenever i come here i speak with a lot of confidence the reason is i know that the problem with the world is that intelligent people are full of doubts while the stupid ones are full of fun so for the next maybe half an hour This is my stupidity. Now, this is the agenda of my stupidity with you for the next half hour. First of all, let's try to understand what is end of life care in terms of its definition, in terms of the load that is there worldwide, and in terms of what is exactly the DNR concept. Now, some definitions that we are going to use for the purpose of this talks are: what is an end of life care? end of life care is care of a terminally ill patient till we can give good death to that patient this is what is end of life care euthanasia two types uh, either a passive euthanasia or an active euthanasia but basically euthanasia is a good greek word for good death so it can be active euthanasia where you can deliberately give something to kill the patient or passive where you withdraw something so that the patient dies what is do not resuscitate do not resuscitate means treatment decisions taken prior to the cardiac arrest with the consent of the patient or the proxy of the patient to refrain from providing cardio respiratory resuscitation resuscitation while we continue to do certain things so this is what is the legal definition of dnr and unfortunately in our country death is not yet defined only death is defined in terms of brain death only that to in the organ transplant act so that is the most unfortunate part the load of end of life care patients worldwide has been captured in the global atlas of palliative care of 2014 which was prepared by the who and the wpca wherein they say there are 20.4 million patients of the end of life care globally every year out of which 98 persons are elderly 79 up to 8 98 persons are basically middle income and low income and the most common causes are cardiovascular disease cancer or chronic respiratory disease and hiv and diabetes mortality situation in india i do not have the exact figures of the end of life care patients in india but there was a study that was performed by the sipla palliative care and they say in india there is no social security and that is because because of that there is financial burden on the relatives because there is financial burden on the relatives there is high, high incidence of uh dama that is discharge against medical advice and because there is lack of legal protection to the doctor doctor resort to uh, defensive practice and unethi unethical jugards as i call them and because of lack of care at home there is a lot of suffering and that's the reason why i sometimes feel whether end of life care is holistic care or holistic suffering that is something that i ask myself now a little look at the dnr concept the ethical consideration ethically dnr should be guided by the principles of autonomy beneficence that is the best interest of the patient and non maleficence no harm the intention of dnr should be to kill the pain and suffering and not to kill the patient or not to hasten the death of the patient so this is what should, not only you should do it but you should be seen to be doing it you shouldn't be seen to be killing the patient you should be seen to be killing the pain and suffering of the patient and it is about giving a dignified death this is what is a dnr ethically doctors opt for dnr in following situation either the life sustaining treatment is likely to be futile or it is likely to bring an undignified death or it is likely to cause misery to all concerned or it can be when there is a brain death like situation or it can be in for a condition where there is no treatment available 
I think there are some indications, but we do not talk about them. We are very quiet about those indications, and these are financial and physical or psychological burden for the relatives, society, or healthcare providers. Meaning, money is over. Now, what do you do? Make life support. Ban kar dalo. Or presence of another salvageable patient deserving the care because it is more likely to have better outcome. Like in an NICU, if there is a premature and little less premature, you will tend to give care to the one who is a little more mature. Than the one which is more premature. These are some of the unethical reasons for which we may do DNR. And sometimes doctors at times have to withhold DNR, even if the the patient is deserving to be given DNR. In cases like where the relatives are not available, or the relatives are available but are not giving consent, or relatives available but there is conflicting opinion about the uh, in between the different relatives, or if you are in a situation where there can be A may or may not improve kind of a situation. So that is the time when doctors would not want to give DNR even if the patient is deserving. Two types types of DNRs. Everybody knows that either it can be withholding the life sustaining treatment, uh, and some or sometimes they call it do not escalate. Also, they call it DNE, wherein what you are doing is you are refraining from putting on ventilator or you are refraining on putting on a central line or a replacement therapy. So this is. withholding i mean the treatment that could be beneficial for the patient or withdrawing withdrawing the life support uh, uh, support treatment uh, like withdrawing ventilation withdrawing the inotrope support and this is the crux of the discussion today and that is what is called as passive euthanasia what can we commit to do and omit to do ethically in dnr one is we can commit to do chest compression i mean uh, i mean we can omit to do uh, in dnr a uh, chest compression we can omit to do intubation we can omit to do ventilatory support we can omit cardiac resuscitation drugs and we can omit defibrillation but even when you are omitting to do all these things in your dnr we cannot omit to do things like clearing airway providing oxygen giving posi- position for comfort of the patient controlling bleeding if it is there providing pain medication so just because you are doing dnr does not mean you cannot you are not supposed to do all these things on ethical point of view so having understood what dnr actually is from the ethical point of view let us now try to find out the challenges faced by doctors and administrators the ethical dilemmas and the legal dilemma instead of going into just the theoretical discussion of the dilemmas i thought i'll take clinical situation so let's have a look at the situation number 1 when in here is a terminally ill example a cancer patient needing intubation needing central line or needing ventilation and the relatives come and say hum aur nahi afford kar sakte so the relatives are just not ready to pay any more but the patient is ventilation the patient needs intubation the patient needs a central line now the legal dilemma here is do relatives have any locus standing to refuse escalation that's my point number 1 my point number 2 what if the courts consider these escalation as life saving measures so this is going to be something which is a life saving and the clinical establishment act and the permanent the katara case tells us that anything that is life saving we are legally bound to do so what if courts consider that and what is the legal definition of life saving treatment that also we need to understand and the last thing is if we do escalate in private hospitals madam bill kon barega is the question so these are the legal dilemmas which the doctor is facing and the administrator is situation number 2 similar terminally ill patient is conscious at this moment of time and the patient is ready to give a dnr, DNR consent now such an undertaking in a hospital status again will court treat this as a living will will court agree that there was no pressure or coercion in the hospital setting where the patient was and can can a magistrate be brought in the hospital to record this dnr consent that the patient is giving so this is situation number 2 or situation number 3 is a brain dead patient on inotropes and on on ventilator now there can be two possibilities wherein the relatives are willing for on organ donation or possibility number 2 relatives are not willing for organ donation now if the relatives are willing for organ donation no problem at all because we know these two sections one section which defines brain death all functions of the brain stem having permanently and irreversibly be damaged 
and we know that it can be certified and we know once it is certified then we can withdraw the life support after the organ retrieval and then the needful can be done but this hota the organ donor transplant act is are not uh, for today's discussion i'll leave it aside i want to discuss this situation wherein the relatives are not willing for organ donation then again two possibilities river relatives are not willing for organ donation but relatives are ready to give consent for dnr now can you do the needful just because the relatives are giving consent for dnr if we do the needful what if the relative becomes hostile later on other relative supposing one relative gives you a consent for dnr what if the other relatives are not willing for dnr dnr so there are two relatives one is saying kar dalo dnr and another one is saying mat karo or there can be situation where the relatives are not willing for dnr and not willing to pay any more in such a situation what is that is the dilemma in front of the hospital administrators and the uh, clinicians and also the hierarchical issue matter when there is a variance of opinion amongst the relatives is not yet finalized by the court the hierarchical issues is finalized for financial matter for estate matter but when it comes to giving dnr consent that has not been finalized by any of the supreme court judgment so in dnr who is the legal person to give consent and decide the best interest of the patient is it the parents the children the spouse the friends and in case there is a variance of opinion whose opinion supersedes the opinion of the other person so that has not been decided by the court so that also becomes a dilemma and i said what pe kya hota hai tab to aapke kya karu aise ho raha hai but at the moment i get a phone call like this what i tell them is just a jugad right because we doctors know are ready to do everything in in terms of jugads and hum log ke legal legal baat mein dekh rahe hain apan jugad karke is problem se bahar nikal jayenge so what are the jugad that i tell them give dama discharge but again if i give dama discharge what if the relatives deny this dama discharge relatives bole nahi idhar hi rakho tar kya jugad number 2 shift the patient to government hospital in a cardiac ambulance again the answer the question is what if the relatives deny can i involve police what will the police help me cooperate with me to take this patient away to a government hospital these are the questions that are always there and just because we are in pune there can be a puneri kind of a jugad also a typical puneri jugad and you know that puneri jugad is what ask the relatives to sign an undertaking to say that we do not longer we no longer believe in allopathic treatment and we want to take this patient away for ayush treatment and aap ethically bhi correct ho aapne kisi treatment ke liye patient ko bheja aur aapke paas consent bhi hai so you can send this patient away for any kind of homeopathic treatment or allopathic treatment in their own residence so these are the jugads that we tell the patient but this jugads will work only if the relatives are in sync with us which means teri bhi chup meri bhi chup patient gaya So no longer is this jugad working if we are not in sync with the relative. So this is one thing that you have to remember, and every jugad is medical legally very risky. But we doctors know, हमारे DNA में है वो jugad हमारे DNA में होता है. Medic MTP after twenty weeks not allowed. एक काम करेंगे, mysoprost डाल देंगे, वो आ जाएगी labour में और फिर हम ऐसे दिखाएंगे कि वो MTP नहीं था. Patient came with. pains and right? these are the jugads that we have been doing always so hum log legally apne liye sab kuch theek karne ke piche nahi rehte hum log kya rehte jugad karke nikal ja rahe hain that unfortunately is in our dna we tend to take the whole burden of the hospital of the administrators of the patients of the relatives on our own head aur apna kaam karte hain that is the problem with us clinician so we have to learn to ask for risk free solutions for our problem these can come from legislations and from case law so let's have a look at the present day statutes to guide dnr and uh, dnr in such a way the doctors are protected what is the world view on active euthanasia the active euthanasia is allowed in netherlands in belgium and switzerland even uh, supposing aapko apna active euthanasia karna hai to all you have to do is go to switzerland wo karke denge aapko so the only thing i have to spend to go to switzerland so that is allowed only in these countries but it is not allowed in uk spain austria italy germany france 
are also not allowed in our country. So when you when it comes to active euthanasia, forbidden country is not allowed in our country. What about passive euthanasia? So these are some of the cases of passive euthanasia that you need to know. This is only if you're you're a student of law, you need to all know all these cases. Otherwise, don't even look at this slide because it's a very busy slide. When it comes to understanding the those IPCs and those case laws in our country, the one thing that you need to understand is these two IPCs concerning euthanasia. Number one is IPC number three zero six, which is about abetment of suicide for which there is ten years of imprisonment and when a doctor is assisting for passive euthanasia, he should be protected from this IPC, isn't it? Because otherwise he will be seen as abetting a suicide. So that's number one. Number two is IPC number 309, which is attempt to commit suicide for which there is one year of imprisonment. In the, wherein I am suicide karne ki koshish kar raha ho, to mujhe ek saal andar dal di. So this is, this is something very, ek to mein suicide kar raha ho because mein tension mein ho. ऊपर से कोर्ट आता है कहता तू और एक साल अंदर जा अंदर जाके तो मैं ऑलरेडी डिप्रेशन में हूं और मेरे को एक साल के लिए अंदर डाल दिया बट द प्रॉब्लम इज दिस वाज एक्चुअली दिस आईपीसी वाज वेरी इन डिटेल दिस आईपीसी वाज डिस्कस इन द अरुणा शानबाग केस वर्सेस द यूनियन ऑफ इंडिया एंड इट हैज कंसीडर्ड दिस टू बी एनाक्रोनिस्टिक एंड डिजर्विंग डिलीशन बाय द पार्लियामेंट सिंस द पर्सन अटेम्पटिंग सुसाइड डिजर्व्स काउंसलिंग मोर देन पनिशमेंट बट If the suicide is to be conducted under psych psychological stress, this is okay. But the suicide is con to be conducted because मेरा जिंदगी का सब कुछ हो गया बेटी की शादी हो गई मैंने जितना कमाना था कमा दिया जो करना था जो मेरा mission of life complete हो गया अभी मुझे मरना है इसके लिए this kind of an suicide is not allowed. So it is not a constitutional right of a person to die. Right. So let us study some cases, old case laws from Indian Supreme Court. And let us, I said, as I said, keep the hota aside for the purview of today's discussion. These are the old case laws. The first case, Ratnam versus Union of India, the IPC three not nine, that is the attempt to suicide. He in the judgment it was said it is violative of Article twenty one, and they said that it is wrong to criminalize attempt to suicide. Then came the Gyan Kaur versus State of Punjab case, where the right to life under Article twenty one includes right to life with dignity till death. डेथ आपका राइट नहीं है बट डेथ तक आपको अच्छा क्वालिटी लाइफ मिले मिले ही दैट इज योर राइट द आईपीसी थ्री नॉट नाइन इज स्टिल कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनली वैलिड अकॉर्डिंग टू दिस जजमेंट बोथ एक्टिव एंड पैसिफिकेशन एशिया इन दिस पर्टिकुलर सुप्रीम कोर्ट जजमेंट वाज नॉट अलाउड इन द नेक्स्ट केस जस्ट बिकॉज समन फील दैट इज मिशन ऑफ लाइफ इज फुलफिल कैन नॉट कैन नॉट अप्लाई फॉर अ सुसाइड एंड डाय एंड देयर आर सम केसेस व्हिच डू नॉट गेट मीडिया अटेंशन बिकॉज़ of obvious reason like this pil in rajasthan two judge ben said that santara practice of jains is unconstitutional but we can understand the government does not want these kind of a cases to be discussed in the media and that what it is not getting a proper media attention now these cases dealt with the fundamental right to life and right to die then it dealt with whether ipc 309 is violative of the article 21 and whether passive euthanasia is allowed in our country or not then came the landmarks aruna shanma case which dealt with passive euthanasia for a persistently vegetative patient and i don't want to go into the details of the case everybody knows that that he was a staff nurse from km hospital who was attacked and sodomized by a sweeper and she was persistent vegetative for 36 years and was living only on mashed food which was being provided by the km staff and the prayer of her friend pk virani was that the hospital staff should be directed to stop feeding aruna shanbag because there was no point in she living as a persistently vegetative person now i don't want to go into the details of the case i just want to come to the guidelines that was given by the aruna shanbag case which which says, says that if the patient is not capable of consenting the parents the spouse close relatives next friends or doctors can decide on euthanasia in the best interest of the patient reflecting what would have been the wish of the patient we need need attention about hierarchy of consent here i mean the court has just mentioned either parents or spouse or close but the hierarchy of who can consent also should have been mentioned in this particular judgment and what we have to do is if we feel that the patient deserves a dnr then we have to apply to the high court because the high court acts like a parent 
तो हाई कोर्ट विल एक्ट लाइक अ पेरेंट ऑफ द पेशेंट सो वी हैव टू मेक एन एप्लीकेशन टू द हाई कोर्ट द हाई कोर्ट विल अपॉइंट अ बेंच ऑफ टू जजेस द बेंच ऑफ टू जजेस विल अपॉइंट अ कमिटी ऑफ थ्री एमिनेंट डॉक्टर्स अ न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट अ फिजिशियन अ साइकेट्रिस्ट and there can be or there can be a pre uh, appointed committee the committee will submit its report to the high court then high court will give a decision whether to do dnr or not following the principles of best interests of the patient and the views of the doctors and the near relatives now when this judgment came all those who were working uh, for uh, end of life care patients were happy chalo passive euthanasia in our country is now allowed but the intensivists were not happy because the option that was given in the aruna shanba case is very time consuming you have to go to the high court it's time consuming it is costly because you have to i mean the it, a cost is involved in making a, a, a writ in the high court financially and psychologically it causes a lot of burden uh, on the patient and it gets prolonged it addresses only passive euthanasia and it does not address the end of life care in its entirety so the savior was again the judges And that's the reason why phone calls started coming to Doctor Bharti. So my life was not so good, not so good because of this judgment. And then came the judgment of 2018. This is the Common Cause Registered Society versus Union of India. Again, not going into the detail of the judgment, I will just tell you what is what was the judgment. Number one, active euthanasia not allowed in your country. Everybody accept that, and we are we are happy about it. Passive euthanasia is allowed. as per the guidelines of the aruna shanbag case so which means withdrawal of life uh, sustaining treatment in patients who are not competent to give consent follow the aruna shanbag case option now the third thing that was told by in his judgment that we can withhold life sustaining treatment we can we can be there is no need to escalate a patient if the patient is adult and conscious at given you a consent So, if the patient is adult and conscious and gives you a consent saying that do not escalate, you can do that. Then, additional point which is very important is an individual has a right to make an advance medical directive or a living will. This is a constitutional right and requires no legislation. So, if I have a living will, then my daughter can very easily do the needful for me. So, this was living will then appeared to be a savior for all stakeholders. Everybody thought living will झंझट खत्म, right? तो सब लोगों ने अगर living will बना दिया, तो ये problem अपना end of life care का जो है ना withdrawal of life sustaining uh, treatment खत्म. Here is a report of 23rd of February 2011. Well, Dr. Lopa Mehta, who is an anatomy, some if somebody is from KM Hospital Bombay, they would know Lopa Mehta is our teacher in anatomy. she applied for a living will in the just uh, judicial magistrate first class the judicial magistrate first class refused to give her sanction of the living will because it says that standard procedure or state of the state or the central government to register a living will is not there so only there is a judgment but there is no standard procedure to register your living will and a survey by times of india only 25% of aware are aware of there that there is something called as living will everybody was aware so but in general public only 25% people are aware only six of them who are aware have made a living will how many of you made a living will nobody right very few so that, i mean for a for an elderly person like me it is important you are too young parents but then only 6% of those who know that there is a concept like if living will have made it so but 87% thought that it was necessary for telling them my question is for the lawyer friend most of the lawyer friends have gone away and my question is for rajit rawls i have added a line about my wish on dnr in my own living will the the financial living will that i made i have added this very gusar ki ek line that in case i am in a end of life care kind of a situation within 72 hours You can stop the ventilator and you can stop the iron ore. I have registered in a local registration authority now. उसको मालूम ही नहीं पड़ा मैंने ये लाइन घुसाड़ दी यार उसको मालूम ही नहीं था उसने एक्सेप्ट कर लिया तो ना आई हैव गोट एन ऑफिशियल रजिस्टर्ड डॉक्यूमेंट ऑफ लिविंग विल इफ आई एम एडमिटेड इन जुपिटर आईसीयू इन एन एंड ऑफ लाइफ केयर सिचुएशन डॉक्टर राजेंद्र विल यू आस्क योर इंटेंसिविस टू डू नीड फिल इफ माय डॉटर शोस यू दैट लिविंग विल एंड माय लॉयर्स विल हैव टू देन टेल मी 
will you stand by dr rajendra as a deputy of course despite this it is not allowed unless i get a living will registered with the judicial magistrate first class so maine ye kaam kar diya hai lekin fir bhi i am very sure that it will not be possible for rajendra to to do the needful for me even in that situation so that is the reason why we need to do a little bit of advocacy on this we have good judgments on past euthanasia we have good judgments on advanced medical directive but no guidelines to follow this rajendra will be still jittery to do the needful because so ultimately what we will do is so again tabhi walke nahi rahega tabhi aur koi rahega usko puchhenge abhi walke ki daughter bhi bol rahi kar raha to walke ne already likh ke raha so sir what is the demand do not resuscitate stop the ventilator stop the hypotrop but don't write on the paper this is the demand that we usually do what we need to do is advocacy and activism and many an advocacy and activism have been done by several associations the first advocacy was done by the indian academy of neurology and indian association of palliative care iapc the office bearers met on the 15th of august 2015 they formed elicit which is an end of life care task force in india wherein their aim was dying is inevitable but good death is not inevitable that's what they say for making good death possible they said that there has to be enabling legislation there have to be good judgments and a proper medical guidelines and also the indian society for critical care went into uh, the supreme court and uh, registered a pil because of the difficulties of registering level will and the supreme court has just given directive that the stakeholder should meet and formulate guidelines and unhone yahan se call apne paas pe right so what exactly do we aim with these advocacy we must know what we want only then we can do advocacy so number one our expectations from the law makers that is the politicians of our country is to have a central act for eo uh, end of life care where is the aim of the act should be formation of an end of life care committee and simplifying protocols through legislation and what we demand from our politicians are only three basic things number one validate the advanced medical uh, medical directives or the living living will validate that form a very good procedure for doing it establish process of withdrawing and withholding life sustaining treatment so as to protect all the stakeholders legally also and ethically also and define that that they have not done yet only the kerala government has defined procedure for rendered declaration in a non organ donation only kerala government has done it no other government has done it and these three things do not require any budget all that is required is our lobbying with these uh, with these politicians so this is what we expect from the politicians our expectation from the judiciary is to make the guidelines of aruna shanba case a little, little easy to implement can they say not uh, there is no need to go to a high court go to a go to a smaller court instead can there be a fast track procedure say something which can get over within 5 to 10 hours i mean when we take a decision we have to do the needful within 5 hours isn't it so can there be a procedure which is fast track or can there be an easy online procedure of making an application to the high court and doing it online there has to be practical solutions for registering our living will also and our expectation from the civil society is to create awareness of living will and join hands with activists for pils and writs so ultimately before going i have to have tell you something about what is the way forward for our clinicians and the aha office bearers also i mean we cannot be just discussing it and not deciding on what we can do as a way forward so for that i need to show you one video if it is possible for the organizers to start the video and that right there is the 
so problem related to the So, uh, all I so just to conclude, what I feel is we have to flood the High Court with cases requesting passive euthanasia as per the guidelines of Sur Aruna Shanbag case. Because we cannot be doing jugars every day. Instead of doing jugars every day, every day you make an application to the High Court. So, let the High Court be flooded with all these cases. The way we flooded the High Court with the MTP cases, those cases more than 20 weeks, we flooded the high courts with these cases and ultimately the judges are coming cases are So they will un, uh, eventually be, uh, will understand the importance of this particular aspect. Let's flood the Supreme Court with writs and uh, uh, PILs. Let's make this litigation free of charge for the patients. I mean, this is what we did for the MTP cases. It was free of charge. 
for the mtp patients and the relatives let's find lawyers who are ready to take it up either free of cost or at a low cost let's convince our lawmakers to wake up this to this genuine problem of the society and let join hands with activists like nikhil i'm not saying just nikhil but there are many activists like nikhil let's join hands with them because i feel that again slide i mean that was the last slide i feel that if nikhil can alone do it i think the difference for the npr then we can collectively make a difference in this country thank you very much for your participation and the discussion again sir Hello. Thank you. 
Hello, am I audible? I think I'm audible. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very memorable uh, seminar for me because I was not supposed to be a speaker in the panel discussion and I got pulled in by the moderator and I was not supposed to speak on this topic. But Dr. Marchway uh, texted us that he is involved in some serious domestic emergency and he has apologized profusely because of which I have put together this uh, presentation last night. Okay, so I was awake beyond Cinderella timings, putting up this. Fortunately, I've just completed a full module on legal and ethical issues for an institute in Hyderabad. So I also begin with a disclaimer, like the previous speaker, <laughs> that I am not an expert on this, but uh, I'll try to do my best because I don't like to disappoint the uh, delegates and the attendees. Okay, so let's see. How, what we can do. So although we, the topic says MPPR 2021, I always feel that unless you know the history, you cannot know the present and you cannot design the future. So we'll start with MPP Act 1971, uh, 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 but before that you should know because your generation probably is not even interested in what happened in 1861 or 1850, okay? So you should know that in 1861, the pregnancy termination or abortion was illegal in India. It was illegal. Okay. No abortion was permitted. So that might come as a surprise to you. I thought I'll share this tidbit. Then the um, MTP Act was first passed in 1971 to permit abortions to be carried out legally because illegal abortion clinics were ending the life of many women. Ladies were dying. In 1994, this uh, amazing uh, prenatal diagnostic techniques, regulation and prevention of misuse act came in. We'll discuss that also later. This is a timeline. In 2002, the word preconception was added to it because genetic labs opened in India. And the MTP Amendment Act has been promulgated in 2002. In 2003, MTP rules came up, and in 2020, the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Bill was passed. So you should know that you know, first there are discussions, a draft bill is prepared, it is sent to experts, and then the bill becomes an act. So the bill was passed in 2020, and the act was then promulgated in 2021. So what does 1971 MTP Act say? Because many of the basic tenets have not changed. Okay. So this act provided for the termination of certain pregnancies by registered medical practitioners and for matters connected therewith, okay? So this I've already told you. The entire country accepted this MTP Act 1971 except the state of Jammu and Kashmir because of the religion does not permit. There are just like we heard about uh, the practice of Santhara by Jains. Similarly, because of that reason, in JNK, this act was never accepted. Okay. In 1971 act, the pregnancy of only up to 12 weeks could be terminated by and upon an opinion of an RMP. Up to 20 weeks could be terminated upon the opinion of not less than two. At least doctors should concur that MTP is required for whatever reason, usually medical reason of the mother or if on ultrasound, some serious congenital abnormality has been detected. It could be performed when continuation of pregnancy is at, um, gives a risk to the woman or cause grave injury to her physical or mental health. Like she's got severe hypertension she will not be able to carry the pregnancy to term or something like that. Or she has a previous injury to the uterus and there is a chance of the uterine dehiscence taking place, killing the woman. That All that kind of thing has to be uh, written down. It has to be recorded. Or there is a substantial risk to the child. So as long as you understand this, that MTP is performed either to safeguard the life or the health of the mother, or in cases where the fetus is considered either not viable or the baby has so many abnormalities that the baby's life will not be normal at all. Okay, so those have to be defined. 
when pregnancy is caused due to rape, MTP is permitted. When pregnancy is caused due to failure of contraceptive, this is the thing used most commonly by married couples. Because, you know, what happens behind closed doors, whatever they give history, that history has to be taken as proved by the doctor. So this is the commonest reason given by uh, couples when there is an unplanned conception. Either the husband is not ready or the wife is not ready or they are whatever. So they just give this reason failure of contraception. But it is legally permitted to do MTP if you say that this has happened because of contraceptive failure. It has been amended in 2002, where a district level committee is empowered to approve or reject a private place for MTP services because clinics started coming up, maternity homes started coming up. The word lunatic was there because if the mother is not in you know, full possession of her senses, then MTP decision can be taken by somebody other than the woman. So that word lunatic was considered very you know, offensive because it was a mentally ill person. And stricter penalties were introduced for dubious MTP to save the life of the women because women were dying because of sepsis after unhygienic uh, abortions carried out in unauthorized places by uh, ill-qualified or unqualified doctors who were calling themselves doctors, but they were not really doctors. Okay. So now what happened in the year 1980 was that the Supreme Court, as I was saying, if no one is hearing, you have to shout. So, so many cases of uh, women who were deserving of MTP beyond 12 weeks came up to the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court favored relaxing the abortion deadline. And there was a consensus that there is a need to change the law because before this, above 20 weeks, you could not do MTP for whatever reason. I mean, God forbid the woman is not covered for ultrasound at all. She's living in some remote area. Uska pehla ultrasound 22 weeks pe hua hai. At that time, if fetal abnormalities have been detected, everyone knows. The poor doctor also knows. The patient also knows. Husband also knows. Everyone knows. But because it is 22 weeks, no MTP allowed. So who's going to bear the burden of that child's bringing up? So because of that, this was a top-down directive by the Supreme Court that it is time for us to relax the upper age limit. In the world, the situation is different. And those of you who are watching BBC, CNN, or on social media or on TV would know that American public is divided completely on this issue of abortion. They are not even talking about 20 weeks or 24 weeks. They are talking yes and no. That's fine. Okay. So worldwide, there are very strong and very uh, fragmented opinions about abortion per se. And as usual, religion comes into it, activists come into it, the activists, and they are equally vocal and equally powerful. There is a group of activists which is screaming and shouting. They are called pro-life activists that, you know, we the, the moment conception is there, it's a living thing. It's a, it's a life. We can't allow that life to be destroyed. They say that instead of abortion, an unwanted pregnancy, even after rape, they say that the the uh, lady or the girl, or even if she's minor, should be counseled and supported, allowed to take the pregnancy to term. And once she gives birth, it is the community which will come in and show that the baby is adopted. What's the problem? You see how opinions differ? And those, of course, who are in favor of abortion are equally vocal. They keep screaming that, who are, who are you to decide? How is the community the owner of my body? How is any religious group the owner of my body? How can you decide? It is my body. I am likely to die giving birth to this baby. And you are just promising tomorrow I deliver the baby. Nobody comes forward to adopt the baby. Who is going to bring up the baby? And what about my mental trauma? While I am carrying the baby, I have developed an attachment to the baby. I don't want to give away the baby for adoption, but I am not. I am just a high school student. I don't have the money. And with rape, there is so much hatred that the hatred is getting transmitted to the baby. So when you are hating something that you are carrying in your womb for nine months, how happy will you be for bringing up that baby, which is the product of rape? So it's a very, very contentious subject and worldwide opinions differ very strongly. So the MTP uh, Amendment Act of 2021 was promulgated on 25th March 2021. And this is 
platform ministry of law and justice those of you are interested in legal matters we should know that uh, any of the legal provisions which are applicable to healthcare are to be found in the ministry of law and justice some are to be found in ministry of health and family welfare okay so don't look in only one place and now thanks to google auntie you can do the google search hopefully you will be guided so this is just the timeline i don't think we waste time on this so the strength of this mtp act are that it amends the act to increase the upper limit for termination from 20 to 24 weeks and the upper limit can be extended on recommendation of a medical board okay and these are the differences mtp act 1971 and 2021 up to 12 weeks one doctor 12 to 20 weeks opinion of two doctors here they have reduced it up to 20 weeks only one doctor 20 to 24 weeks not allowed 20 to 24 weeks now allowed two doctors of the same category it should not be that you know you get one radiologist and one gynecologist not not like that so both should be gynecologist and more than 24 weeks was not allowed in 71 but here interestingly that even beyond 24 weeks a medical board can be constituted in case of substantial fetal anomalies okay it is however silent on terminating pregnancies due to rape that have crossed the 24 week limit just 3 days ago i got a whatsapp question i am an unpaid honorary consultant to a lot of friends all over and it's a client case the patient is in opd sos 16 year old young girl obviously a minor pregnancy 24 weeks brought to the hospital for mtp कंसेंट फॉर्म के ऊपर अंगूठा लगा हुआ है उसके इलिटरेट फादर का एंड द गर्ल इज रिफ्यूजिंग शी सेज इट्स अ लव चाइल्ड आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू गिव कंसेंट सो आई वाज बी गास पेशेंट इज इन ओपीडी क्या करें 16 ईयर ओल्ड गर्ल क्या करेंगे एनीबॉडी 16 ईयर ओल्ड गर्ल दैट 24 वीक्स प्रेगनेंसी नॉट डिटेक्टेड बिकॉज़ नोबडी इमेजिनड दैट शी इज कैरिंग अ बेबी दे थॉट मोटी हो रही है रोज लड्डू खा खा करके now she is saying she is accepting she says this consensual sex it's my love child i am not going to abort this baby so that guy is saying what am i going to do is a medical superintendent of a hospital in some state what should be done it's a medical legal case a 16 year old girl she is pregnant the pregnancy cannot happen by anything other than rape even if she says it is consensual because she cannot give consent she is not of age to consent you consent but can you go ahead with mtp no because it is her body right she has a right over her body father or mother or guardian cannot force her to have an mtp it should be absolutely crystal clear to you even if she is a minor it is her body we just heard below 12 years consent is not informed consent is not valid that means about 12 years informed consent is valid if she is old enough to have sex with her boyfriend she is old enough to give consent or decline consent for her mtp right so the correct procedure is admit medical legal and then call the medico social worker for counseling of both the girl and the parents ya to ladki ko samjha do कि तुम कैसे पालोगी ये बच्चा और या पेरेंट्स को समझा दो कि अब जब होना था हो गया एंड इट्स 24 फोर वीक्स यू डोंट रियली हैव टाइम राइट एंड इफ दिस बोर्ड विच एंड दैट इज द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ दिस बोर्ड दिस बोर्ड आल्सो हैज सोशल सर्विस कोऑर्डिनेटर्स इट हैज लॉयर्स इट हैज अ बोर्ड ऑफ डॉक्टर्स इंक्लूडिंग डाउन फर्स्ट थिंग इज कैन द इज द गर्ल हेल्थी इनफ और फिट इनफ टू कैरी द प्रेगनेंसी टू टर्म No, you can't say that. Of course, she's healthy. Sixteen-year-old girls have given birth. It's not unheard of. So, first thing is this: if that question is answered in no, then it is a no-brainer. It is a health. It is a risk to her life. Then it becomes risk to the life. Whether the mother is twenty years or sixteen years, then becomes immaterial. Then the board opines that MTP is a in the best interest of the. Patient. then the patient has to be again the patient still has to be counseled you still cannot do it without her consent but if she is healthy enough to take the pregnancy to term then the role of the 
social activist or whatever social worker comes in can you then convince the parents to support the girl and help her and support her to carry the baby to term i know it sounds like some utopian dream or something in india how it will happen you know but can the girl deliver the child and the child can then be put up for adoption there are so many people long ago i was asked on a surrogacy debate when the surrogacy act was not there long ago so 10 years ago and i spoke against it that so many orphans are there in this country adopt kar lo na unko why are you spending so much money and effort in surrogacy so there are a lot of people who are willing to adopt a child i am telling you the way a situation can be handled and it can never be handled unidirectionally by a, either a gynecologist or a administrator you can't do that you have to involve other segments of the society it's a complicated term but the time frame for the medical board decision is not there because of it i believe a 10 year old girl who was a rape victim about a year ago ended up taking the baby to term because the medical board was divided and they could not even give a decision that's all that is a no brainer where it should have been kind of mandated there they hesitated and hesitated till the baby Uh, if they cross that limit of safe termination neither termination is safe nor delivery is safe. that is tragic okay and of course the overall shortage of trained doctors i am keeping it short pcp and dt act pe aa jate hain it is basically promulgated to save the girl child uh, it is enacted on 1994 and amended and implemented in 2003 then it was again amended in 2011 intent is to prohibit the prenatal diagnostic techniques for sex determination because in india unfortunately and i believe it is common in some other countries also we are not unique it happens other places also but here it was became rampant that with ultrasound and all or with other amniotic fluid testing genetic testing and all the sex of the baby used to be determined and our whole nation is so mad for a boy child moment they used to come to know the sex of the fetus mtp okay and i told you mtp mtp ka biggest jugad was like sir was saying you are reason failure of contraception a girl baby can see ho gaya to failure of contraception the boy baby can see ho gaya to no failure of contraception so we are selective right we are very selective so in order to say, prevent this injustice with the unborn girl child this and then they define the prenatal diagnostic procedures okay and especially when there is a genetic lab or a genetic clinic very detailed i won't read them and then the sex selection techniques which are pre fertilization also post fertilization pre transfer and post implantation so there are steps there are steps in this and the steps have been now interesting thing for you all is ki pre natal diagnostic testing is legal in some situations so when it when is it legal for fetal causes when there are chromosomal abnormalities suspected when there are genetic metabolic diseases which have to be Uh, diagnosed before hemoglobinopathy sex linked genetic diseases congenital anomalies or any other disease as may be specified by the central supervisory board there is a board also which has been put into place because as i told you either we do do our job ethically or the legal authority will come and sit on our head maternal causes when prenatal diagnosis is legal age above 35 years because after the age of 35 years women when they conceive the it is a statistically proven fact that the chances statistical chances of the chromosomal abnormality in the uh, fetus are higher that is a fact physiological fact the pregnant woman if she has undergone two or more spontaneous abortions or fetal loss has been exposed to potentially teratogenic agents such as some drugs radiation infection or chemicals the pregnant woman has a family history of mental retardation or physical deformities as spasticity especially those who are genetically transmitted you have to prove that this particular illness is transmitted genetically or any other condition right and this this is the huge regulatory body which is sitting on the head of hospital administrator and gynecologist or anybody who is running a genetic lab or a uh, prenatal diagnostic center okay so there is a policy making body there is a central supervisory board and there is a state supervisory board and under that is a district authority and there are two no there is an appropriate authority and there is an advisory committee i won't go into the details but just tell you as i told you that these committee especially the advisory committee has three medical experts one legal expert one officer matlab that is government appointed guy 
and three eminent social workers i just gave you the example that you have to have a 360 degree approach especially when the pregnancy has crossed 12 weeks little bit higher risk beyond 12 weeks and even higher risk beyond 20 weeks and 24 weeks ke baad to then you better walk on eggshells okay now we are a country of jugaad in more than one ways you know acche ke liye bhi jugaad karte hain par mere khayal se badmashi ke liye zyada jugaad karte hain us logon ne this was conducted a survey in 2015 so this is what they found ki फीमेल टू मेल रेशो गिरती चली जा रही है देर आर नो चेक्स और इंस्पेक्शन ऑफ दीज जेनेटिक लैब्स इट्स पेपर में है बट नो बडी इज इम्प्लीमेंटिंग इट मेजोरिटी डू नॉट मेंटेन द क्रूशियल डॉक्यूमेंट्स एज पर पी सी पी एन डी टी एक्ट एंड नो पनिशमेंट आई मीन पीपल आर कॉट द रिपोर्टिंग इज डन द कंप्लेन इज फाउंड टू बी करेक्ट बट नो बडी इज पनिश्ड एंड इन दिस क्वालिफाइंग केस ऑफ टू थाउजेंड एटीन a doctor was arrested for conducting sex determination in the back seat of a car ultrasound hi to chahiye sir this i heard in punjab also i have done one stint in punjab punjab is also notorious for female feticide the two top states for female feticide are tamil nadu and punjab okay so punjab mein baruti van badi popular hua karti thi usme jagah hoti na piche to maruti van modify kar li thi ek doctor sahab ne और उसमें एक उन्होंने बेड सा लगा दिया था काउच एग्जामिनेशन काउच और एक वो अपना पोर्टेबल अल्ट्रासाउंड लेकर के गांव गांव जाते थे without any warrant and this offense is non bailable getting bail is not the right of the accused the courts have the discretion to grant bail so i mean in the morning you heard the advocate who was trying to give lot of courage to the defaulter saying ki ghabrao mat non bailable offense mein bhi bail mil jati hai but i mean are we really going wanting to go there as a society that first you commit an offense which is non bailable then you look for a smart lawyer we'll become like america वहां पे है एम्बुलेंस चेजर्स खूब देर कॉल्ड एम्बुलेंस चेजर्स लॉयर्स आर कॉल्ड एम्बुलेंस चेजर्स पेशेंट को थोड़ी सी चोट लगती है वो अपना बिजनेस कार्ड लेकर के आ जाते हैं इन केस यू वांट मिलियंस ऑफ डॉलर्स एज कॉम्पनसेशन कॉल मी आई हैव गॉट सो मेनी मिलियंस ऑफ डॉलर्स एज कॉम्पन्स हाउ दे दे पब्लिसाइज देमसेल्फ हमारी कंपनी पब्लिकेशन है जैसे वो बोलते हैं आई हैव वन 20 केसेस ऑफ मेडिकल नेगलिजेंसेस एंड टोटल पे आउट वाज इन इतने यूएस डॉलर्स मिलियंस दे दे मार्केट देमसेल्फ लाइक दैट the writer is that court cannot take cognizance of an offence unless the complaint is made by the appropriate authority or any person who has to give a notice of less than 15 days to appropriate authorities and no court other than that of metropolitan magistrate or judicial magistrate first class shall try these offences so these are just two riders again to ensure that you know doctors dignity is protected and these are the penalties i still feel they are very low but for whatever reason they are there Three years imprisonment and ten uh, thousand, then five years imprisonment and fifty thousand, then suspension of registration. First conviction, may you uh, remove the name from the uh, register of uh, no MCI register for second conviction, permanent removal. These these penalties are there for violation of the PCP and DT Act. Person seeking to know the sex of the fetus, that means usually the father or mother, imprisonment three years or fifty thousand fine if repeated. Five years and one lakh connected to advertisement. By the way, you're not supposed to advertise this that you know you are conducting. So if there is an advertisement relating to this again and some miscellaneous offences. This was the first case where uh, a doctor uh, and a technician were punished 
for sex determination. And uh, the modus operandi became talked about. And this is not so old because it's not social media. So I thought I'll probably share it here. Yeah. The doctors have found ways to convey the sex of the baby to the parents without writing anything or without speaking anything, by the way. They don't speak anything also. So what they did in this case, what is the prende kya tha? If the doctor tells us to come and get the report on Monday, we know it's a boy. Friday means it's a girl. Then there were colored things, okay? So I used to use different colors. Ki use karta tha. Ki signature in red ink to indicate it a girl and blue for a boy. No words are exchanged. It's an unspoken thing and one doesn't even have to ask. Look at the greed of the doctor. Now see, he's keeping himself within legal boundaries. That's what I told you. That according to me, Dr. Patankar, I have very strong views on this. Ethics ka jo oda hota hai na, wo law se thoda upar hota hai. Because they are getting away within the legal boundary, but they are still violating Okay, how will you get rid of it? These are statements from the parents of the uh, no, no, uh, sex determination racket. That's how it came to know. Yeah, you break the technician and technician becomes uh, you know state witness. He will tell you, technicians will know everything. Like in the OT, there is a nurse, he will tell you everything. Which surgeon is good, which is bad, which causes bleeding, which causes more complications. They all know, the nurses know everything. Similarly, technicians. In this case, okay. and the doctor doesn't have life, some doubt does. Again, our country it's a country of middlemen. If a doctor does not do anything, they are doubt. Hote hai. Jo sachche, jhute, whatever, whether they are right or wrong, whether they are, you know. Because unfortunately, the couple, because of social pressures, are so desperate to know. And they know, want to know only for one reason. Why do they want to know? They only want to know for one reason. Because if it is a female fetus, they will immediately go in for FTP. They won't call it feticide. We call it feticide. A legal person will call it feticide. They'll call it MTP. Okay. And then they'll get that surprise. Oh, it was a female baby. They didn't know. So both accused in this case were held guilty and convicted for the above offenses. So they were jailed also for two years and paid some fine, etc. Now we quickly come to surrogacy. This is a slightly longish thing, but uh, again, surrogacy is still evolving. COVID has, by the way, COVID has taught us an amazing lesson. Do you know that many babies born out of surrogacy for uh, foreigners who had chosen surrogacy as the ultimate medical tourism option? Those babies were born during COVID time after lockdown and travel restrictions and they were orphans. Do you know that? For one year, sir, kisi ko pata nahi tha ki ye in bachchon ko phale ko tha. Because the mother, surrogate mother, has done her job, delivered the baby, just like Zomato delivers your food. She has been paid already in advance. And she has gone. Where does the baby go? The parents are in Australia or UK or whatever. And they can't travel. So they were called orphan babies of surrogacy. There is Mimi. Okay, I have yet to see that. Okay, thank you. So orphan babies of COVID born by surrogacy. So even though this surrogacy act is there, it doesn't cover that because as per this act, surrogacy is not permitted for the, this act. The Indian act does not cover foreigners. So when they, when the, when the then they went running to the government. The government gave them a shut up call that this act does not cover surrogacy for foreign nationals. So those babies are without a nation, without a law to protect them, without their biological mother, without their adoptive parents. So they, they had to be. Um, looked after by the nursing home or the institution where they were born. You understand now this responsibility that there are, there will always be situations and you have a long way to go. Okay, people like us have almost completed their active career as hospital administrators. But when you will grow in the, in the speciality, you will find that whatever we big people and so-called experts are teaching you, 
will get defeated by the waves of time. Time is a very big feature. COVID has taught us a lot of things. So, 2021 में ये सर्कुलेशन एक्ट आया है पर इसमें फॉरेन नेशनल्स के बेबीज का प्रोविजन नहीं है, ओके? शाल we have defined what is surrogacy, what is a surrogacy clinic, what is a surrogacy procedure. Okay. So again, see, Indian infertile couple. This surrogacy act covers only Indian infertile couple. Does it cover single men and women? Okay. I don't know how Karan Johar got away with it and Sushmita same. And Karan Johar though falls in two categories. He's a single man and LGBTQ bhi hai. Sushmita Sen is a single woman, but I think unhone court ka darwaza hi khat kar paya. And they have proven that they are financially stable and can provide a loving. Now Karan Johar stays with his mom. So he he took his mom along. Ki, you know, the female female part of the protection to the children will be provided by my mom. Okay. So again, if the woman is widowed or divorced, then the age limit has been set. And again, Indian origin couples. So no Australian and all are covered. Who is not eligible? This I think is discrimination against men. I really do feel that, you know, not fair. I mean, if the women can say that we can do everything, then man should also be able to. I, I don't believe in this. So in this, I totally have divergent views. But this is how the law is written right now. Single and married women. Again, I think it's quite discriminatory. Couple in living relation. Amazingly, you know that Living relationships have been given almost the same rights as married couples. So then why not give them this right? What's the problem? Because sometimes I try, tend to believe that old saying, you know, that the law is blind. Really, sometimes I feel that the law is blind. So this again is very funny. LGBTQ again. Foreign couples, of course. Intending couple who already have a child biologically or through adoption surrogacy. Who's healthy? If they already have a healthy child, they cannot really opt for surrogacy. But if the child that they have has been born with some serious congenital defects or you know some mental issues, retardation issues, very low IQ or whatever, then they can opt for surrogacy. Who can be a surrogate mother again? Everyone cannot opt to be a surrogate mother. Every married woman, this is not ever every, every married woman so the, the, that means an unmarried woman cannot be a surrogate mother. Age has been specified, should have had a child of her own. That means proven fertility. This is taking me back to already 18th century Victorian time where, you know, a woman had to prove her fertility before she was even chosen to be the bride. How they did that. Has a child of her own, willing woman, so no coercion, uh, should not provide her own gametes, only once in a lifetime. So one woman can be a surrogate mother once, but uh, many uh, we know we know this This is violated. There are women who have taken it up as a means of earning income, right? I don't know how they get around it. I don't want to go there. Okay. And they have to be medically fit. And can it be altruistic purposes? Just like the organ donation was altruistic purposes. Organ donation was not done for money. It was all altruistic. It was heart bleeding for these hormones. Similarly, similarly, surrogacy may the, the surrogate mother is deemed to have a lot of you know milk of human kindness. Then again, certificate some some these are all you know medical indication. There's a lot of paperwork which goes into it. And if any gynecologist is opting to go into the surrogacy thing, they better know. There are these formats are available online, so I won't go. And they must have insurance coverage for the amount and manner, okay? Before starting the procedure, a special consent has to be obtained from the surrogate in the language which she understands. Informed consent, okay? And again, I told you, altruistic surrogacy. Paisa kaadan pradhan nahi hua hai. I don't know how it is, but it's not recorded anymore. And commercial surrogacy means that there is a center which says that this is a surrogacy center. They are open about it. They do it for like the, the center has uh, gynecologists and social workers and psychiatrists and whatever, what have you. They usually have a legal in-house counsel also. 
and they are upfront about it that we are you know going to do it on a commercial basis gestational surrogacy is when a gamete or you know fertilized embryo is implanted into the womb of the mother okay so these are all semantics you can read more about it but what is allowed for the sur surrogate mother under the altruistic surrogacy arrangement aap altruistic to keh rahe ho but what is allowed to be paid that is the medical expenses such other prescribed expenses incurred on the surrogate mother and some insurance cover okay so this is given to the surrogate mother or her dependents or her relatives what is prohibited uh, no charges no fee no remuneration so if the gynecologist fees is there your gynecologist expenses there so um, surrogate mother cannot be paid that It has to be paid to the gynecologist the surrogate mother cannot claim that so she is kind of adopted by the couple for the duration of the uh, pregnancy okay so no remuneration kehne ko koi remuneration nahi koi expenses nahi koi monetary incentive nahi and uh, to surrogate mother or her dependents or her representative so this i think there are a lot of loopholes in this they want to see feel because whenever you say or 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 i mean in a in a country where women are treated half the time like objects what is to prevent a good for nothing unemployed husband to use his fertile wife as a source of income if he is being paid or kar diya na why not to the woman where is the or in it she is the one who is carrying the baby she is the one who is taking the risk she is the one who is delivering the baby maybe they should have added to her dependents or representatives in case of her death that sounds good okay. यू अगर सरोगेट बेबी को जन्म देते समय मर मर आ जाए कहीं तो उसके पैसे उसके डिपेंडेंट्स को मिलने चाहिए दैट आई थिंक इज अ लॉ सक्सेशन बट दिस साउंड वेरी रॉन्ग टू मी दैट और 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 करके दे हैव लेफ्ट अ लॉट ऑफ लूप होल्स एंड देन द क्लिनिक्स हैव टू बी रजिस्टर्ड रजिस्ट्रेशन पीरियड इज वैलिड फॉर थ्री इयर्स एंड रजिस्ट्रेशन सर्टिफिकेट हैज टू बी डिस्प्लेड नाउ what if the surrogate mother changes her mind she can only change her mind before the implantation of the embryo once the embryo is implanted in the womb there is a written consent form that she has signed and that consent form gets invoked once the implantation is done no then she can't back out and say that i don't want to carry this pregnancy to term and uh, again same principles apply during surrogacy also if mtp has to be done same principles apply like that of the natural pregnancy that is all i'm going to say about it okay and then embryo oocyte sperm freezing is prohibited import of embryos or gametes is completely prohibited because i told you know it is only for indian couples so no import of embryos or gametes advertisements are completely prohibited this again is a joke you know i was grilled like anything during my online lecture sir by young students because i told them that you know doctors are not advertise their practice or themselves I said what ma'am what ma'am i said yeah yeah because there is a code of medical ethics which i i taught them law and ethics but ma'am we see them i said yeah because they are violating ethics they are not yet violating the law now you see the difference what is ethics and what is law there is a code of medical ethics which says that doc no doctor shall advertise himself or his practice but same thing is for surrogacy advertisement is completely prohibited but then bichare wo how will they get the return on investment no how will they satisfy their investments investors the the surrogacy clinic will go bankrupt within a year if they don't advertise so there is a try total divergent view which the law has taken the act and what is there in the real world in the real world this is not possible surrogacy is an expensive business set up and to run it is a risky business the again the positivity rate is even in best ones it is 50 to 70% nowhere it is near 100% right so what are what are you doing i mean you are telling them not to advertise how are they going to break even there is a right to the child this child is deemed to be the biological child of the couple who have chosen surrogacy and entitled to all rights and privileges of a natural child 
Okay. It strictly prohibits abandonment of the child in India. I told you, na, COVID ne showed us the mirror. The child was abandoned. Children were abandoned. Several of them, but not because of any fault of the parents, the couple who chose, because they were not allowed to fly out to India. Okay. Then there is a surrogacy registry in the country where you have to, you know, send the details. Then there are surrogacy boards, and there are a lot of authorities involved in surrogacy procedures. I don't think we go there, so I I think I'll finish quickly. I'll just conclude. This is uh, the concluding slide. The MTP Act, PC PNDT Act, and Surrogacy Act are all aimed at only. in our society and in the way we perceive women. Otherwise, they will only remain something to be talked about in conferences and discussed. They'll not really, they won't have any teeth. Because people with bad intentions have already found ways to circumvent them. And only if the society changes its attitude towards the female fetus, towards women in general, and the doctors decide not to support illegal demands from the patients, whether the demands are accepted due to financial incentives. Because if the doctor is too honest, or sometimes the doctors are too kind, their heart is also bleeding for the infertile couple. That's what they say. The financial incentive is never talked about. So uh, there has to be a societal change. There has to be a change amongst the mindset and attitude and practices of the doctors. And till these two things happen, there is a law. The law has come before the society is ready to change. So let us hope the society changes. Any questions? I know we are running behind time, but if someone has got some question, which uh, there's no point, Dr. Patankar, there's no point in denying na, in case somebody wants asking. I mean, if you guys don't mind waiting a little longer, we can have other questions. Okay, no questions. Anyone from the back seat, if you are listening? Nobody's sleeping at least. No questions. All doubts cleared. Absolutely. But it's still going on. It's still going on. There is just a little caution now because of the this surrogacy act. This is very new, no, sir. This act doesn't cover foreign nationals, no, sir. Foreign nationals to unhone usme cover hi nahi kiya. Uh, so you can't you you can't have your cake and eat it. Totally. I'm talking to you. Is that when 
you source, you are happy delivering them. The moment they become a liability, you can't throw them in the dustbin, my dear. It was done like this only. The institute supported them. That I will also have to research. No, 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 no special home will take it. The parents have not even signed signed up for them. You, I don't know how to explain it. The, that's what I'm saying. The surrogate mother has given birth to them. The surrogate couple has not come and signed the adoption papers. They're formally adopted. That's that's my understanding. There is a formal adoption procedure. But they are they are in Australia, no? They couldn't travel, no? They couldn't travel. Ah, no, obviously. Yeah, yeah, that, that has happened. So they were temporarily orphans. That has happened. That has happened. They have. But there was a gap. There was a gap. It's not as if they have been permanently abandoned. I'm saying that COVID upset the accomplish completely. So nobody was ready for that. Nobody was ready for that. Okay. Yeah. No, they can come. They can come. Who's saying they can't come? Medical tourism is not to medical tourism. But they don't get protection of the surrogacy act. No foreigner can come to India. Whatever was that before the 25th Now the surrogacy act has come. The rules have not yet come. But from the 25th of February to uh, 2022, this, year, this is enforced, which means now no possibly all this act has come because the foreigners would come to India and they could victimize all this for poor mothers with less amount of money. They would come to India. So basically, the act has come to curb these policies. So now, from this, from the February of 25th, no foreigner can come to India. All those babies that you were mentioning will be handed over to yeah. the foreigner. They've already done that. So maybe this is an outcome of the huge, huge problem which was faced with these COVID orphans. Maybe. I'm, I can only understand it. Yeah. Person of Indian origin. Oh, yeah. That's a foreigner. This is what I mean. A foreigner can come to India and take ART A foreign couple can come here, and if you have an ART center, that center can give a treatment to the foreigner, wherein the foreigner is using his own sperm and her own uh, oocyte. And she can become pregnant with an oocyte donor also. That's okay. But cannot uh, uh, do embryo transfer in a surrogate. So that has to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It is not. Madam, the, the word Jugad is going to work here also. There will be many IVF centers who are running surrogate centers here in India, will now go to Nepal, will now go to Pakistan and have these centers there. And they will continue their practice. Madam, another. You Jugad. have the answer. See, see, see what, what happens is that there is there is a surrogacy center with a big reputation in India. That entire surrogacy center will not lift up and block and go somewhere else, no? Just taking the surrogate mother there, it sounds very silly to me. The, once, the, once the implantation and all has been done, once she is, you know, in the third or fourth month of pregnancy, if the foreign couple are ready to foot the bill, और अगर उनके पास इतने ही पैसे होते तो वो इंडिया में आते क्यों सर होगे सिकराने के यू यू हैव नॉट अंडरस्टूड द मेंटालिटी ऑफ द फॉरेन नेशनल्स हु कम टू इंडिया आई हैव सेवरल फ्रेंड्स अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड ओके डॉक्टर्स तो आई सी दैट दे टॉक बिग बट व्हेन इट कम्स टू स्पेंडिंग दिस मच मनी आल्सो नो दे टॉक बिग बट व्हेन द क्वेश्चन कम्स ऑफ मनी तो एक एक डॉलर दांत से पकड़ते हैं उससे ज्यादा तो जेनेरोसिटी हमारे पॉकेट 
हाँ वो एक कप चाय भी तुमको पिलाते हैं ना कॉफी भी पिलाते हैं तो दस बार एहसान जता देते हैं तो आई हैव नो एब्सोलूटली नो यू नो स्टार इन माई आईज अबाउट वॉट अ फॉरन कपल इज लाइकली टू डू आई यू रियली थिंक दे आर गोइंग टू टेक हर विद डेम पिज्जा ट्रेवल अकोमोडेशन सोशल यू थिंक दे आर रेडी टू टेल देर वाइट नेबरहुड दैट दे हैव एन इंडियन वुमन हु इज द सरोगेट मदर ऑफ देयर चाइल्ड really think about that they are also going in a community they are also going in a community now now with this act ab to ho gayi nahi ab to ho gayi don't give ideas okay to people who are chal <laughs> i think we are short running short of time thank you now we come on to the last speaker of our uh, today we have uh, the last speaker of the day mr kalakshan sir from the department of education sir स्पीकर्स का ये Dr. Ravi is an MBBS, uh, a diploma with a diploma in emergency medical services. He also has a diploma in emergency medicine, a master's in emergency medicine, and a fellow in accident and emergency medicine. Currently working as head uh, of department of emergency medicine, Manipal Hospital, Karadi, Pune, with an experience of 14 years. working in and developing emergency departments of various multi specialty hospitals and has a special interest in forensic medicine and medical legal aspects of uh, clinical practice over to you sir thank you 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 thank you
So that is what I would want to put forth here. Let's go ahead. Okay. So what is so different about the integrity department? I'm talking about a set of thinking of it, a base on this, uh, on this that due to the ethical challenges in the emergency department, it's something which can be taken as a separate seminar altogether. The whole thing. That's why we can bring them together as small pieces. Okay. So what is so different about the emergency department? Can anyone say here? Can 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 you anybody tell me what is the difference? I yes, okay, okay, thank you so much. Coming just from the administrators, I'm very glad. I felt nobody understood us. Perfect. So, this is what we do. Was worked in the state department which has something to discuss and to come up with ideas. It's setting for me, thankfully. <laughs> so, and I have a colleague who still works there. So, this is what it is. If you read the captions, it is something which, you know, makes no sense. But this is what happens whenever it's a busy department, it is always like that. We don't make sense of what we are doing. It's chaotic and we find peace in our chaos. Giving an example of this, I used the department from years back, and uh, probably you know it, it's in the city itself. This was during the 2018, I think, or Yep. So this was the scenario on a daily basis. If you can count the number of ambulances with their doors open, patients on ventilators, BiPAPs, CPAPs, oxygen, waiting to be taken inside the emergency department. I remember in one month, we had admitted 1,416 patients from an eight bedded emergency department. So it was mayhem. In this ethical legal, I have something which makes no sense at that time. But is there a, is there a way beyond that? Can we put Jogar everywhere? Let us see. Now, what I would like to say is, you know, you what what is that instrument next to that? Dole. Ye dono taraf se hai. And Hamara department SI. We get hammered by the patient side, we get hammered by the hospital side. Why? Because humne kuch galti ki to kahin na kahin mein aata hai. Baki departments ka pata nahi chalta hai. Right? So let's go ahead. Case number one. Uh -huh. Sure. Okay. So, MLC, medical legal case. Now, is there a specific definition for medical legal case? What I have been told by experts, again, you know, with disclaimer, again, I'm not a legal expert here, but what they say is every case, every patient is a medical legal case. potential, right? There is something called as injury reporting. Now, what we are supposed to do as doctors, what we are, uh, you know, bound by the law to be uh, doing is informing any kind of an injury. There, there's a, you know, uh, uh, I mean, there's an SOP of how and what needs to be reported. It is called as injury reporting. There is nothing called as medical legal uh, case as far as law goes. So injury reporting is something which from the emergency department we should be doing to the police, which generally is done, which we call our MLC inform kia kya. That's what is done. But it is injury reporting. Now, given this case, it's a 34-year-old female who presents with a fracture of her four uh, forehand. Okay. Now you can see the X-ray, it's in front of you. She says she slipped and fell in the bathroom. Possible? Yes, very much. The husband is very anxious, seen apologizing to his wife. Why? Possibly. Possibly. And you know, when, when we are experienced in the department, seeing, reading emotions, reading faces, reading expressions becomes our second nature, right? So we know there's something going wrong there. 
patient needs an admission and surgery which has been told by the orthopedicians the incident seems suspicious right injury reporting has to be done to the local police right everybody agrees it's the end of the day please say something when i'm sleepy thank you so challenges patient and her husband requests not to file an injury report or an mlc whatever we want to call it right now okay now what are we supposed to do that we cannot we cannot surpass that we have to convince them that we have to have to and have to inform to the police irrespective now what to mention in the mode of injury she fell in the bathroom or the husband broke her hand now here the patient is 37 years old right she is an adult can is in good sense she can give consent and she can give uh, the details of the incident whatever she says has to be documented as again as rightly said it's alleged history of we are not detectives we are not the law makers we are not the people who protect law yes we can always mention what has been told to us as an alleged history because whatever has been told to us we have documented simple we do not get into this kyo hum to rakshak hain bacha lenge is aurat ko no not at all that's not our job our job is give the right treatment do the legal proceedings and go ahead so what are the legal implications if you have mentioned that okay the husband has uh, pushed her the lady is not telling you that she might deny ki humne kab bola i fell down then you are in trouble tumhe kisne bataya how can you write mujhe laga tha aisa that doesn't hold good so go with whatever is being told to you by the patient death certification is another problem which we all not problem it's a day to day business that we uh, you know take care of a patient with parkinson's type 2 diabetes mellitus and uh, i've written twice anyways sorry <laughs> he is an 82 year old bed bound gentleman brought in by his son found to be dead on arrival it, it it happens always right brought in dead dead on arrival what do you want whatever you want to call it patient is not registered with the hospital possible relative request for cash on delivery uh, cash on delivery see what's wrong with you i think so i think so this is what happens whatever you see here the it's not cash on delivery it's cause of death certificate so sorry about that <laughs> so relative request for a death certificate or a cause of death certificate right so what do you do we'll give it na 82 year old gentleman dead kyun unko bhejna hai पीएम के लिए फिर आपको एमएलसी करना पड़ेगा पुलिस आएगा फिर बॉडी लेके जाएगा व्हाट यू वांट टू डू दैट नाउ फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड इज अ डिफरेंस बिटवीन दिस डेथ सर्टिफिकेट वर्सेस कॉज ऑफ डेथ सर्टिफिकेट डेथ सर्टिफिकेशन इज समथिंग व्हिच एनी रजिस्टर्ड मेडिकल प्रैक्टिशनर कैन डू वेयर वी से पेशेंट एग्जामिन नो ब्रीथिंग एफर्ट्स नो पल्स नोटेड नो कार्डियक एक्टिविटी ईसीजी इफ डन can be written that asystole on ecg patient is certified as dead patient declared dead or patient certified death that does not mean that you know what has caused the, the death it might be an 82 year old man and I'll, let me give you an example of this how i got to understand the importance of the the rule that is there that you should not be certifying death if you do not know the patient there was a patient who was who used to stay in a uh, uh, old age home this patient was again elderly gentleman with parkinson's dementia stuff he was brought into the department was you know declared dead on arrival and because they requested we thought okay fine we'll give the cause of death as you know whatever we want to you know we can give something or the other luckily what happened to the attendant who was there with the patient there was a call that came and he gave me the phone so i picked up the call it was the family lawyer this man who died had a property of 300 crores and what he said he sir have you seen this patient earlier i said no then i would request you not to give the cause of death so there's a lot of litigation which is going on in his family and in case if uh, you know it goes to court you will be dragged to court for no reason 
I said, okay, thank you for calling me. I am not giving the cause of death. So be cautious about when you give the cause of death. So be careful. And this is something where we have to follow the proceedings. So what are the proceedings in this case? Call, call up the police. I mean, uh, as register it as a, uh, you know, brought in dead patient, hand over the body to the police. Whether the police wants to do an autopsy or not is beyond our prerogative. Okay. That is none of our business. We can always issue a certificate, uh, you know, we always give a, uh, uh, you know, letter to the uh, dean of uh, uh, Sassoon that, okay, we are sending this body for autopsy. Whether the police wants to take it or they want to do whatever uh, they, but we have to hand over the body to the police. Now, again, there is a jugad here. We don't do anything. Sida Sasun leke jau. Hamme nahi pata kuch. People do that. We have seen that. Ki hamar pas to record hi nahi hai. Patient aaya ha. Patient is there. But you will have to go through with all these things. So it's better ki aap uthao aur leke jau Sasun. Wahi pe kar lo jo karna hai. It happens. Legally allowed? Definitely not. But then again, this is again a jukhar. You know, sir was using the terms which caught up to me. Moral versus legal? Which one would you choose here? Morally, TK, 82 years ago, QY, should we, you know, put them through all these nonsense? Legally, you should be holding on to the legal side here. Options available, as I said, it is not something which should be done. So the only thing that goes here is, if you do not know the patient, you can always give them an option. If you have a doctor who is a registered medical practitioner, who is ready to give you cause of death. Sometimes it happens, yes, my doctor will give Prescription, the patient is declared dead. This doesn't hold good. It has to be form 4 if it is in a hospital. If it has to be form 4A if it is in the is if it is out of hospital bed. Okay. Now consent has been really taken well by uh, the previous lecturers. So consent being another thing. Now giving you an example, a 19-year-old female presented with pain in abdomen and PV bleeding. Anyone practicing clinician here? Only if I'm confident that there is nothing wrong, there's no foul play attached. Sometimes it happens that patients are bed bound and the patient doesn't come to the hospital. The relatives keep a follow up with the doctor, they bring the reports, they show them. It is advisable that if you know this patient and if you have the faith, can be given. The cause of death can be given. But if you have not seen the patient for six months, and the patient has never turned up for a follow-up, you can absolutely deny cause of death. You can say, no, I've not seen this patient in the last few days, few weeks. I do not know what was wrong with him in the last six months. So you can definitely deny cause of death. Because, see, I can give a cause of death, but am I ready to take that risk is the question. So if I'm ready to take the risk, I can give it. No problem whatsoever. But this is something which is as a, uh, you know, caution to be careful. Preliminary cause of death is given by the uh, from the auto, I mean from the forensic department there at the government hospital. And in case if they want to preserve uh, you know viscera or some kind of uh, this, then the final report comes later. But the preliminary report is given immediately, and the body is handed over. Sure. Yes. See, uh, doctors are not generally pulled to the court so easily. It is something, it was a one-off case, which I just took an example of. In case if you have given a cause of death, and if there is some kind of you know foul play which has been filed by some relative, you might be called in, ki, how did you come to the conclusion of this cause of death? If you say that the patient had an acute anterior wall myocardial infarction, what evidence do you have? You have not done an ECG and you have said that patient had an anterior wall MI. That is not uh, the right thing to do. So you have to have evidence of what you're giving the uh, death as. Now, if a patient who you have been seeing, you know he's in case of, you know, dementia, Parkinson's, diabetes, cardiac disease, etc. 
it can happen there's a sudden cardiac death cardiac arrhythmias this electrolytemia whatever chronic cachexia is another cause that has been given by doctors that is for perfectly all right because you have records this is the condition of the patient this is how it has worsened and then we have come to this conclusion you have to be able to justify what you're writing so there is no hard and fast rule that you cannot assert uh, you know give the cause of death but if you're giving the cause of death you should be aware that you should be able to defend it later in case but not that uh, doctors are dragged into court for certifying a death so don't worry now coming to the uh, next case it's a 19 year old female presented with pain in abdomen and pv bleeding what will you think of okay miscarriage and abortion anything else absolutely ectopic pregnancy would come first right problem accompanied by the mother she gives a history that lmp was 40 days back and i meant uh, missed to mention that this is an unmarried girl do you want to do an upt of course we would want to patient does not give history of sexual activity so is there a need for upt mother is upset when we ask for consent for upt this happens very frequently ha huh? believe me mother is upset when we ask for upt patients patient avoids talking much in front of the mother absolutely so this is what is the first step to do send the mother out we do that it might be funny but we do that well ma'am please wait out sir is the emergency department we're not supposed to be inside get out so she goes out then we ask yes bolo <laughs> so the thing is can you do a upt without telling the patient it has to be again a written consent from the patient to do upt now once upt is done it is proven that the patient is pregnant now comes the ethical challenge what do you do this is a ruptured ectopic pregnancy patient is an impending crash how do you explain this to the mother mother will be now that again can we do that the uh, daughter is 19 years old exactly now the thing is if going by legal terms you can easily throw the mother out of the hospital if you want to take consent from the uh, daughter uh, rush her to the or let the gynecologist take care of the ectopic stabilize and discharge home but then the question would come <laughs> it will be the parents ultimately she is an unmarried girl and 19 years old india mein bahut kam log kamate hain so here the problem comes but we have to be clear forward about telling what is the scenario we have to tell her later whatever happens happens we have to tell after of course asking the patient now legally agar koi baad mein complain hota hai ki nahi doctor ko maine mana kiya tha bolne ke liye mere parents usne bata diya abhi tak gaya nahi hai india abhi wahan tak but yes it is a difficult situation and we do face it Sometimes we have to tell ki aisa aisa hai problem hai kuch pet mein hum log ultrasound karenge gynecologist aake baat karenge to we try to gynecologist ke hath mein de do hamara headache chala jayega now that is our jugad but that is not how it needs to be see legal point of view the patient is a uh, is an adult can give consent for surgery and anything else for that matter provided that she is not in hypovolemic shock and you know drowsy completely not able to comprehend consent has to be taken for upt consent has to be taken for surgery if need be explaining the situation is a challenge but we have to find out some solution to how to and then if the patient's bp is on the lower side it falls under the category of emergency care it will be life saving for this patient because within no time there will be a huge hemoperitoneum patient will die of hypovolemic shock so there is no more time to be wasted we can push this patient to or provided everything else is within control you know in indian scenario we have to be a little cautious about it but yes it falls under emergency category and intervention has to be done case number 4 another problem in er is communication now patient has is a 58 year old male brought in ed with history of chest pain ecg showed anterior wall stemi 
Okay, he's got a heart attack. Patient collapsed in the ED. By the time we could intervene and do something, in CPR initiated, we intubated the patient, DC shock given, this, that, going on. Intubation done. Patient could not be revived after 30 minutes, 45 minutes of CPR and all ACLS guidelines and whatever you want to call it. Relatives are upset now. Once go and say, oh, your patient is dead. They get upset. They start alleging you that you have done incorrect treatment. The patient came walking, complaining, talking. What went wrong? Patient is dead. Did anything go wrong here? You did the right thing. You intervened. Now, how many of you have given CPR ever? Quite a few of you. So whenever you, there is a crash and we are giving CPR and managing a patient, it is a time intensive, it is a labor intensive work that we do within a very short period of time. We don't have much time to spare. Now in this situation, what happens? We generally forget what is happening beyond the cut. Think about this. A person who is 58 years old and today's era 58 is not old. He was walking, talking, suddenly had chest pain, brought to the emergency department, he collapsed. But did you inform this to the patient's relative? They are standing outside the door, like what just happened, what is going on, they have no clue. Please understand. You have to explain what is going on. Now, what I personally do is always, always and always send somebody out ki patient ke relative ko bolo ya bula ke leke aao. In case if I am the team lead there, and I'm intubating. I cannot leave the patient and go. So I always call the patient relative. So how to explain? You have to tell them truth, point blank. There is no time for, no, no, your patient had a little bit like that. Now your heart, what are you doing? No, be point blank. Sir, your patient had a heart attack, tha, massive. After that, when he came, the patient's heart is completely gone. We are watching the CPR, we are trying to revive. We have to give shock, we have to give medication. Please come and see once again. Then I will talk to you again. Now what happens? Patient comes in, he sees. It might be a shock for him, care what just happened. But he knows that something has gone wrong. And we are trying to intervene. It's not that we are standing by and letting the patient die. He is sent out again. We Initial management has to be very extensive because we are securing the airway, getting the ECG de defibrillation and this and that. Once the patient is a little bit kind of in sync, the, okay, now CPR is going on every uh, three minutes, we are giving the uh, adrenaline. Then the team lead hand over somebody who is senior enough to manage the situation, walk out, give them a full brief of what has happened. Explain them that we are trying our level best to get them. Don't give them hope. Don't tell them nothing can be done. It has to be midway. We are trying our level best. We'll come back and again tell you. Now, after 20 minutes of CPR, we almost know ki whether this patient is going to make it or not. Uske baad, what we do is sama bandh. Right? In very crude language, sama bandhna zaruri rehta hai. If all of a sudden you go, ha, ye, aapka ECG flat line aega, patient mar Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You can get slapped, you can get beaten. So be careful about it. So you go out or train your team to go out, talk to the patient, ki, sir, abhi tak heart ka rhythm nahi aaya hai. We are still trying our level best. Maximum or hum log 10 se 15 minute kar sakte hai. Agar usme aa jata hai heart ka rhythm wapas to it's good. If not, then we will not be able to do much about it. So then they'll be like, Aisa kaise, this, that. answer a few questions, then you go back. Show that concern that, oh, I need to be inside to take care of the patient. Come inside or wait for 10 minutes. See, after 20 minutes, generally the team lead walks out. practice karo. No. Very sorry to say this, but this is what happens because we know we can't revive the patient. So what happens? At that time, you should be very cautious. I'll tell you that later why. So then once the patient is declared dead, wait for the ECG to come as complete cases. Go and tell them, hey, sir, I don't think he is able to make it. Last ka five minutes, he will still try, but I don't think that anything can be done. By that time, they start accepting you there's something going on. In case you want to see it, then go. You bring that patient's relative together, show them what is going on, then again take them out and make them sick. And finally, when you get that ECG, which is a flat line, you can go and declare the death of the patient. Now, one thing, what should be seen on your face is concern and empathy. You cannot be, ha, wo, tha, bhi, kya. Yeah. Now, language is another problem. There was a student of mine uh, doing her MEM. <laughs> she is doing very well right now. But uh, what has happened? She was from South and she didn't know much of Hindi. Forget about Marathi. So she comes out. 
tomorrow patient ta na udaya literally and i was like oh, mai gaya <laughs> So I had to tell her you can't declare like this, Baba. You have to be more empathetic, sir. My, क्या गलत बोला सर? हम लोग गलत कुछ नहीं बोला तेरा तरीका गलत था. So be careful about how you want to put it across. Next patient, seventy-three-year-old male, known case of congestive cardiac failure in decompensated phase. That means his heart is absolutely failed now. Nothing much can be done. Multiple admissions in last two months. So you know this patient is not going to make it now. Things are not looking very well. Brought in with severe breathlessness, NIV was put, but there's a failure of NIV. Needs intubation. Relatives request not to intubate. You know, if you don't, patient will crash. What to do? Are we? Patient is not in a state to give consent. That everybody agrees. saturation 60% is delirious so if the patient we know this is again end of life i need not go into the details this was taken care of in the previous lecture very well so end of life kind of patients where this patient cannot be salvaged we have to take it in writing d and i can be given by the close relative we generally do not intubate such patient maintain it on niv but be cautious about documentation we have to document it properly that it has been explained that outcome post intubation might not also be favorable after inform informing every details of whatever the situation patient's relative did not give consent for intubation uh, aunty uncle or cousin or somebody coming and the actual son or daughter or yes yes now this is of course of course now this point now this point who is the uh, attendant at that point if it is the wife then we need not go beyond that so if it is son uh, see now this again comes with uh, again as sir said both have to be in the same thing if they expect ki nahi abhi to inko theek karke main helicopter mein ghumane le jaunga then we can't do that but if we explain them properly ki see even if we intubate it's not that ki ha inko intubation ki zarurat hai intubate karna padega concern de rahe ho kya it doesn't work like that we have to talk to them for some time that see this patient requires intubation now if we do not intubate his oxygen saturation will drop he will go into a cardiac arrest and might die now if then we are say uska kya matlab hota hai so intubation they don't understand you have to say we have to put him on a ventilator once you use that term relatives understand that situation is not looking good now nahi ventilator pe nahi dalna hai but then again you have to tell them you see वेंटिलेटर पे डालेंगे तो पेशेंट का भी लाइफ बच सकता है नहीं डालेंगे तो ही माइट ही विल डेफिनेटली डाई उसे डालने से ठीक हो जाएगा मतलब वी कांट गारंटी दैट पेशेंट माइट नॉट मेक इट इवन आफ्टर पुटिंग ऑन वेंटिलेशन सो वी हैव टू एक्सप्लेन अप टू दिस लेवल प्रोवाइडेड दैट द पेशेंट गिव्स अस दैट मच टाइम इट हैपेंस कि हम डिस्कस कर रहे हैं पेशेंट क्रैशेस व्हाट केस सिनेरियो इज दैट आई नो द अटेंडेंट फ्रॉम नर्सिंग पर्सन आर मेडिक देन वी डू नॉट वेट फॉर दैट इट हैपेंस Yes. 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 Now in this situation, what I have specifically mentioned, brought in by the son, not this one, the previous one, but this patient supposedly if he's brought in by the son and the family is available there, we generally talk. And if they, and another thing which you should um, uh, notice is multiple admission in last two months, so they are familiar with whatever is going on. Now this is a very specific case I put through because we just had happen to have a patient like this right now. So in this patient. if the son is abroad and if only an attendant has brought who is basically taking care of him at home we cannot wait for the consent to come we have to intubate this patient the reason behind that is it is a life saving procedure to explain it to the relative ki why didn't we not intubate ki are hona to kuch nahi tha to kyun intubate karne ka no these are very specific cases please understand do not generalize this so you should not misinterpret what i'm trying to say it's basically if the relative is there and is on the same page with you which was in fact told to us just about two lectures back 
if they are in this on the same page ki okay now we know they have accepted that nothing can be done no doctor we would not want to intubate him. then yes take it in writing stop it there but if the scenario which ma'am is saying which is very common these days son daughter everybody is abroad fellow is brought in alone staying with his you know attendant who cooks for him and takes care of him obviously he is not a legal guardian to take any call for that at that point we have to do everything till the time they decide whatever they want to do so now it goes to icu's hand where dne dn whatever they want to do so at emergency level we have to intubate this patient so patient might die if not put on ventilation of course can we withhold a life saving procedure i think i have answered that and then the third point documentation it has to be full proof now this one power of documentation i'll just tell you it's a story time now this is about 10 years back when i used to work in chennai uh, it was the beginning of my night shift and one patient had come with a laceration over his forehead where the plastic surgeon was called in was suturing it nicely another patient is wheeled in history of explosion he was a research scholar in a chemical lab when he was doing some kind of an experiment with azide i still remember it very vividly azide chemical it's a chemical which is used in airbags sudden uh, explosive uh, uh, nature without fumes so it is used in airbags so he was doing some kind of an exp- uh, you know experiment the beaker uh, exploded all the glass shrapnels were on his face body arm and this photo is not of that but i managed to find one one glass was embedded into the cornea and this patient was exposed to azide as well azide as a chemical can cause seizure and metabolic acidosis so that is a medical part he had no symptoms whatsoever so luckily the plastic surgeon was there so i said sir can you please help me so he poor fellow came he removed all the glass shrapnels and sutured wherever it was required did the dressing and everything then we saw the i i called up the uh, uh, ophthalmologist ki uh, ma'am xyz patient has come this is what the clinical finding is can you please uh, uh, suggest what can be done she told ki okay you put this gel in the eye just put a pad close it i'll see it tomorrow because anyways we are not going to do anything right now so she asked me whether the turgidity is maintained in the eye or not i said i'm not quite sure i'm scared to really move it because the shrapnel is really protruding out she said don't worry just cover it i'll come and see now this patient was admitted in the icu for azide uh, uh, inhalation not because of the uh, physical injuries that he had now this patient was admitted in the icu then the ophthalmologist saw whatever happened then discharge after two days of time i have forgotten everything after six months the medical superintendent calls me calls me she says dr ravi this is what uh, as a you know summon has come not summon notice as legal notice has come that this patient has filed a complaint against our hospital saying that he almost lost his eyesight so he had to go to some other hospital where it was taken care of but still partially he is not able to see he has alleged that nobody took care of the eye now i remember this patient because this is a very uh, you know rare case as eye poisoning and such things do not do not happen every day so obviously uh, and the hospital which i used to work with didn't have a electronic uh, recording so pulled out all the you know medical records thing went through that i opened the thing i said no i have seen this patient i have drawn a diagram i still remember of the eye where the laceration is with an arrow everything nicely written informed so and so at so and so time advised so and so did so and so done now obviously you know never ever had an experience of a legal notice so called i was scared but 10 years back i was much younger than what i am now so i was even more scared so what happened then we had to go to the lawyer who was the who used to take care of the legal matters of the hospital so i go there the lawyer uh, all you know big shot lawyers you know how you see in the movies all books from here to there uh, and you know fancy chair and everything with his white uh, shirt and everything sitting there he says okay this is the case okay okay fine then he says this lawyer is useless i'll take care of him then he say okay show me the records he pulls the records he opens it up uh, okay he uh, i why did you make the size so i like obviously i had to make what the injury was okay then he turns ophthalmologist also written whatever needs to be done he closes the thing he returns back the file to us you can go you can go i'll take care of it so he already got the point that it has been seen and been taken care of now how did he know that only one thing 
only and only documentation. If I had not mentioned that with the diagram and everything, probably we would have been in soup. So that is the importance of documentation. So what should be done in the emergency department or whatsoever in the as a whole, okay. As you, most of you are administrators. It's the hospital as a whole. Communicate. Learn how to communicate. So that is that whole business is called as a single problem. If you do not communicate well, you are going to have trouble coming out of it. Document. Third is document what you communicate. Communicate what you document, and maintain the records. Make sense. Some important points. I'm not going to drag it any further. Now understand that emergency departments doesn't have walls. It has curtains. So what you speak inside the curtains can easily cross the curtains. We have landed in trouble. I have my colleague to actually say this. So what happens? Relative name is XYZ Singh. And if the lady was supposed to be wheeled into MRI or CT, I don't remember. Patient is really restless not really uh, you know um, wanting to you know comply for the mri and all so we are planning okay we'll call the anesthetist sedate and then do the thing so this fellow who's from gujarat doctor says to another fellow who's also a gujarati in gujarati that give him give her a tight slap she will sleep anyways in gujarati and the patient's son was standing there the son is singh to singh ko gujarati kya samajh mein aata hai do din ke baad Itta bada later. He was born and brought up in Ahmedabad. <laughs> so please be careful about what you or your team speaks. We are being a chaotic, we speak whatever we want to. Sometimes we speak nonsense also. I, I admit to that. But be cautious that please make sure that curtain band hai matlab kisi ko sunai nahi padra aisa nahi hota hai. Another very important point. An angry doctor is always trouble. That means you. If you get angry in a situation, your judgment gets clouded. And in a chaotic situation in the ER, if you lose your temper, it will create trouble some way or the other. You'll forget something or you will either commit or omit something. Okay. Coming to medical negligence, there are only two. Act of commission, act of omission. So either you will omit something or you will commit something. So be cautious. Don't lose your temper. If you are about to lose your temper, just walk out. Take a glass of water, calm down, come back. Because you can't run away from the department. And then, if a patient is shouting at you, if you think that this is going beyond your control, please walk out. You are not a security guard. You are not supposed to confront the patient relatives. Yes, logically, if a person is trying to ask you something, you have all the rights to talk to him. But when it becomes physical, please walk out. You are not supposed to get beaten up for no reason. You are way, way more precious than what otherwise people think you to be. So please make sure you do that. Because I've always advised my team, if there is a chaos, run if you need to. Don't get beaten up. Simple. No questions asked. Thank you.
My apologies. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, Dr. Rajendra is an MBBS and an MD in hospital administration and planning. Currently, the CEO of Jupiter Hospitals, Banir Pune, commissioned and managed more than seven hospitals successfully with a significant role in brand repositioning of the iconic Nanavati Hospital, Mumbai. He is on the academic board of Dr. Valinkar School of Management for MHA course and regional secretary, AHA, Western Regional Chapter, Pune. Namaskar, good evening. Today I am really honored and privileged to have my work with the Board of Science. Happy to be hosting you at Jupiter Hospital at Pune. And for this enlightening series of talks that we had since morning 9.15, this is the first time after the COVID pandemic that uh, AHA Western Region of uh, Pune has organized an event. This is the first of its kind, and I'm sure many more will happen in due course of time. On behalf of the hospital and AHA Western Region Center, I would like to thank all the honorable delegates, that means all of you, and those who have already left, and those who are also online, to uh, be present in person, and some of them online, uh, to make this event a success. It's six o'clock almost now, and uh, you're still here. Sizable, at least seventy-five percent of them are here, which means it is a success. <laughs> and with of this dimension it cannot happen overnight. The wheels started rolling months in advance. Dr. Sreka, Tanush Sreka, actually initiating the whole uh, activity at uh, AFMC's Department of Hospital Administration's uh, office. We've been fortunate to have been backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated team of. AHWRC and of course the Department of Hospital Admin, including Colonel Dr. Surika Kashyap, Dr. Saroj Patnaik, Dr. Bhan Dr. Ajay Ganguly, just to name a few. I cannot thank everyone enough for the involvement they have shown and the willingness they have expressed to take on the completion of tasks beyond their comfort zone. The scientific session was extremely impressive and uh, quite uh, long as well. But I, I'm sure people enjoyed. Of course, pretty good lagi thi this time. Pe. But a big thank you to Dr. Kasper for his efforts towards enlightening us on the legal boundaries of healthcare in the Indian context. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Advocate Milik Sangre, who shared his real life actual experiences of being a lawyer, of course, uh, which will help us in understanding the medical legal aspects in a much more deeper and a simplified manner. I extend a hearty word of thanks to Dr. Panjuram Gokil, a very, very senior joint in the healthcare in the city of Pune, who spared his time for his schedule to grace the occasion and shared his, uh, his insights on the consents, the, the whole uh, major issue of consents, which we always normally face. Grateful to Dr. Dilip Walke handling the post prandial session and handling it very, very well. Dr. Kashyap, wonderful, really enjoyable session. I mean, we refreshed my memory of all the PCPND and uh, MTP acts. And uh, you know, sometimes you need a refresher course and uh, uh, very, very pertinent points with good examples that you gave. Thank you so much for that. Dr. 
My colleague from the advisory board at the Bellinka School of Management, from Mumbai. This time we had planned to have speakers only from Pune, but as an exception, we called him and he gracefully uh, honored us. I wholeheartedly thank all the panelists, including group captain Dr. Tilak, Sardan Dr. Sukhup Patnaik, for the extremely insightful and interesting panel discussion. Of course, others were also involved. Special thanks to Dr. Ravi for handling the last session. You know, it's not easy to be a last uh, last batsman or last caller. It's always a tough time handling the last over. And you did that wonderfully well. I must appreciate a big round of applause for him as well. Special thanks to my friend Sanket Barale. He's not here, but his team uh, helped us in handling the online coordination with uh, Zoom. Thank you so much. Uh, his colleague Dipin was here some, some time back. Vikrant from IT team. My uh, FNB team head, Saroj, and uh, his entire crew of uh, FNB. I'm sure you would have liked the food, and I'm sure you will like the snacks as well. Last but not the least, I want to extend a word of praise for organizing team and the admin staff making this event so wonderfully organized. Of course, there were a few glitches. I have made a list of points and I will correct it in the next session. I also cannot overlook the efforts of our volunteers, including Himani, Namrata, Harsh, Prashant, Sahil, and Anushruti, who gave their last week and work dedicatedly for this conference. Thank you so much, all of you. Sincere thanks and specially thanks to Dr. Kushagra, Dr. Vasudev, Dr. Lavnish, and Dr. Akshay. Thank you, Dr. Akshay, from the Department of uh, Hospital Admin, AFMC, for all their efforts. We hope to have more such enlightening and interesting sessions. And a special thanks to my colleague, Dr. Chandramani. He has been behind this silently. Please raise your hand. <laughs> Madam is calling you here. <laughs> He's my colleague, he's a medical coordinator at Jupiter Hospital and the organizing secretary for this event. They're also participating hospital rounds, holding hospital rounds in Jupiter Hospital for MBA and MHA students, MBA as well, for budding hospital administrators and uh, so that they can gain some practical knowledge on various topics. I hope the worst of COVID is behind us now and I can look forward to more such interactive sessions. We have a wonderful auditorium that we that you all see. Intent is to have a lot of such sessions for administrators as well, where we can have do actual live rounds across the hospitals. And I think that would really help. Uh, I would also like to invite all the budding administrators to enroll with the uh, Academy of Hospital Administration. Those who are interested, just give your names at the reception at the registration desk and we will coordinate with you along with WRC Center to uh, get registered. A lot of interesting events what happen. You could be a part and parcel of uh, attending and participating in them as well. So finally, time is money. Then today we have spent a million for us. You have spent a million for us. Thank you so much. And uh, let's see you once again after some time. Thank you.